that, I'd like for you to help me welcome uh, Dr. Stephanie Hillwick, who will be talking about invisible sexism, eradicating what we don't see. Uh, welcome to the talk. Um, you know, before I get started, um, I did want to let everybody know that this is actually just one part of a whole series of events we're doing. This, is, uh, this month is Women's Month. Uh, this Saturday is International Women's Day. Um, and I, uh, so we have an event tomorrow night as well, a roundtable discussion where several women are going to be talking and then we're going to have a roundtable discussion. There will be a poetry slam on Friday at noon. Um, and then on Saturday at 10 o'clock there will be sort of an inter um, uh, some presentations on international events. Um, and then the film Girl Rising at 2 o'clock. But I also wanted to thank Tori, who's organized all of the events this week. She's a student, and she's really stepped up and done all of this. So I really wanted to give her a thank. This, this happened to her. All right, so let's go ahead and get um, started on Invisible Sexum, which, which I decided to name um, in part because, you know, when we're normally talking about uh, sexism, we're used to talking about the big issues. Um, sexual assault, domestic violence, pay differentials, sexual, uh, sexual harassment, and all of these really do happen. They're really, really important. Girls do get raped, and these things really happen. But sometimes it blinds us to the fact that sometimes more of the more pernicious effects on our lives are actually the things we're not seeing. They're actually the things that kind of slip under our radar and we're not really aware of them. It's referred to in the literature as we really need to move on to what they refer to as the second generation um, of discrimination. So this is what we're really going to be talking about today. Um, the talk, I have a lot of information to say, so I'm going to try to move through everything pretty quickly so I can cover it all. It turns out I'm just really opinionated, but, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to start with the more obvious stuff. And what we're going to do is we're going to move through to the stuff that we probably never have even noticed before um, through this particular talk. Um, some of the subtle forms of sexism are really built into what we refer to as schemas, ideas about people. What we, when we have, we close our eyes and we think of, for instance, we're hiring a new president. We close our eyes and we think, well, what characteristics do we want this president to have? Um, so it's ideas about how somebody should behave in a specific situation, um, how um, an ideal candidate is when we think of hiring somebody. Um, and they're just natural responses. Um, but these schemas, what it shows, however, in these subtle forms is, is we're really good at noticing when something is there. So whenever we see, for instance, the Disney princesses, we think, oh my gosh, they're so sexist. You know, these girls are, you know, we're resorted down to princesses and they're not strong. But then we see something like the Toy Story, and I've never heard anybody say, the Toy Story is sexist. But I would actually rather my child watch The Princesses than Toy Story. Why do you think? What do we don't see in Toy Story? We finally introduce somebody in the second movie. The first movie, what is missing? We don't, we don't see what's not there. Um, exactly. We see when we see a princess. But at least when there's a princess movie, at least we're giving honor to the fact that there's a female character. Um, and so one of the things is these schemas and these attitudes are really the air we breathe, the water we swim in, and so we don't notice them. Um, the first uh, form of subtle sexism is the most obvious. I think the most we talk about it was part of the film that was shown last night, Misrepresentation, but the objectification of women. Um, and the really the most obvious form is essentially we show women and the portrayal of women is that they are objects of sexual pressure. That's why women exist. That's why they were put here on the earth is obviously so we can um, admire their bodies and think um, about their sexuality. Um, when we look at men's magazines, we see images of scantily clad women. And when we look at women's magazines, we see images of objectified women. In fact, 96% of all objectified images are of women. 
You know, the interesting thing is, we often try to portray this as empowering. It's the part of the sexual movement, the sexual liberation of women. Um, and sex is our way to liberation. But it also really reduces us down to simply objects. Um, this, of course, refers to the subject-object uh, dichotomy. <coughs> Subjects are things that do something. They're things that act. Objects are things that get acted upon. And what we're really seeing in our media is men are the people who do things. Women are the people who get things done to them in a variety of um, uh, forms. And even women do this to themselves. It was really sad to see Cameron Diaz posing in a very uh, objectified manner. And the problem is, is that what it does is, is it reduces women to thinking about their bodies as our bodies as projects. How can I constantly improve my body? Um, we reduce ourselves to um, objects. And it even includes issues like slut bashing, calling women sluts um, uh, in workplace and school settings um, along these lines. Uh, and one of the biggest consequences for the objectification of women is body monitoring. Women do this constantly. In fact, they estimate that the average woman body monitors every 30 seconds. How many women in here, since you've been here, that at least one thought of how do I look? Is my stomach a little bloated? Um, how, many, <laughs> how many people in here, is my hair out of place? How many women in here, at several times today, you have done some body monitoring? Um, it is just something uh, we often do. Is our skirt okay? How does my shirt look? Uh, <laughs> these sorts of things. Problem is, is when we are constantly body monitoring, we're not doing other things. We're not thinking about issues, and um, it leads to sexual dysfunction. Um, you don't have as much sexual pleasure if you're constantly thinking, oh my gosh, do so you feel my fat? You know, do you my stomach's rolls? You know, what about my ce uh, cellulite? Uh, it leads to body shame, low self-esteem, lower political efficacy. We're worrying about how we look. We're not worrying about how we vote and how we can impact the world. And unfortunately, it also increases female competition. Women say nasty things about each other. Um, so it has all sorts of negative consequences. There has been a movement to try to sort of improve the images. These are a couple that I've sort of seen through the media. Um, and when I saw these, you know, it was trying to move in the right direction, but I was looking at these images and still something made me a little bit sad about them. And um, that it didn't feel as empowering as it should have. And it wasn't actually until I was making this lecture that I realized what it was I didn't like about these images. What message are these women sending? They're sending a message of, please desire me too. I'm not skinny. Don't just objectify the skinny woman. Objectify me too. <laughs> That's really what they're saying. Don't just find them sexy. Find me sexy. Um, and this is really, you know, the truth is, we shouldn't be objectifying skinny women, and we shouldn't be objectifying women of other shapes and sizes either. Um, I actually much prefer this image in the media. Um, these images of women were Olympic athletes. Again, you notice these women are all shapes, all sizes, um, from tiny little gymnasts uh, to very, very strong, big athletes. But they're not saying, check out my ass, like Cameron Diaz was saying. They're saying, I'll kick your ass. <laughs> these are women who subjects. We're not looking at them and thinking what their bodies look like. We're looking at them and thinking what can their bodies do. Their bodies are competent. They're strong. They're capable. Um, these are images that project power of women. None of these positions of these women are posing in a sexy manner. They're posing in matters of power, matters in strength. What they now referring in the literature to the power pose. Has anybody seen that uh, in the literature? These are definitely women in the power pose. Obviously, when we talk about subtle sex discrimination or invisible sexism, we have to talk about household labor. 
Uh, and uh, these are the statistics. Um, it's referred to as the second shift based on a book that was written in the 1980s, which talks about how women go to work all day and they work their first shift, and then they go home and they plop on the couch and watch TV all the evening. No, oh, they go home and they work their second shift. Um, so women work about three times more uh, in household labor. 18 hours for women versus 10. These are the 2011 statistics. Um, but here's the most interesting thing. A lot of us think, well, we can just change it. But the research has actually found that perceptions of fairness um, impact why women are doing more work. So what they found is that when men are contributing 36% of the household labor, meaning one third, they think they're doing half. <laughs> you mean, I'm doing half the work around here. <laughs> they actually measured people like how, and documented how much work they were actually doing and how much work they thought they were doing. And it was a disparity. When men were doing 48%, meaning they're not quite half, they thought it was unfair and they were doing too much. <laughs> Only when men were doing less than 30% were they willing to acknowledge, yeah, she does a lot more than me under those circumstances. Um, women were even harder on themselves. When women are doing more than 75%, only then did they say, I'm doing too much. When women were doing 66%, they thought it was fair. And when they were doing their, um, when they were doing 60% and their husbands were doing 40%, they thought they were being too rough on their husbands. Uh, which was, uh, I thought, some of the most uh, interesting uh, stuff. Um, so, why do these inequalities <coughs> persist in, their, um, uh, in the household? Part of it has to do with the schemas of women. Women love their children. Um, so when they spend their time taking care of them, we don't look at it as work. We look at it as labor of love. They're doing what they enjoy. Um, they want to stay up all night long with a crying baby, you see. Um, and so love has its own rewards. And it's not like she's a monster. Only a monster wouldn't go take care of a crying baby or give her kids a bath. Um, and so men don't see themselves as getting um, a free ride. The other issue that appears, um, I know this because I dealt with this in marriage myself, is men don't compare themselves to their wife. I'm not doing as much as you, or I'm doing the same as you. They compare themselves to other men. Well, I'm doing more than so-and-so over there. <laughs> You're not married to so-and-so over there. You're married to your wife. But this is part of the thing that happens, is men look around at other men to see what it is they should be doing. Well, so-and-so hardly takes care of his kids at all. I at least put my kids to bed at night. But you're not, you shouldn't be comparing yourself to these other men. And uh, this is what happens. The other issue that appears with this is when women became mothers, all the research has shown that we automatically view these women as less competent and less intelligent. Because when they're doing the housework, unpaid labor, and men are putting more in time in paid labor, they are improving their perceptions of competency and diligence and pay and promotions, whereas she is, of course, reinforcing a schema that implies that she's not as intelligent, she's not as capable, which is why when we compare single women to single men without pay, women are 92 cents on the dollar. But when we compare mothers, women with children, to fathers, men with children, that pay disparity increases to 62 cents on the dollar. So it's a, it's a big deal. Uh, the other issue that um, uh, needs to be addressed is the issue of invisibility. Back to Toy Story that we were talking about before. Anyone here ever heard of the Bechdel test? So it comes up with this rule. How do we assess sort of the gender fairness of movies? And he came up with three rules um, that a movie should be able to pass. There should be at least two women in it. They talk to each other. And they talk to each other about something other than a guy. All of these movies failed the Bechdel test. 
It's an amazingly low standard. Two women who talk to each other about stuff. That's really all it needs to happen. <laughs> and uh, very few uh, pass the test. When there was analysis of this year's Oscar-nominated movies, um, the, uh, there was one person who decided to look at screen time of female characters to male characters. They found that the average male character in a film is viewed 85 minutes, but for women, 57 minutes. Last year, it was even worse. It was 149. The ratio of male to female characters is 2.25 to 1. And one third of all of the female characters are partially nude at some point in the film. So one, we hardly ever put them in movies. And when we do, we make them go in naked, essentially. Uh, this is part of some of the statistics that have come out this year to sort of analyze the, the past top 500 movies. Um, only 30% of speaking characters in movie, and almost a third of the time when they are in movies, uh, they are partially nude. Now, why is this a big deal? Part of the reason it's a big deal is women are told essentially the message that we are given is we don't care about you. You're not valued, you're not important, we don't want to hear your story, we don't care about your lives and the issues you deal with. As women, we are told we're trivial. The only time you're important as a woman is when we can match you up with some guy to be some sort of sexual role uh, in these films. So it's a romantic or sexual role. Really, what women are being sent on a constant basis is women should be seen and not heard. We talk about that for children, but it's really true for, uh, for women. And the problem is, is we just don't simply know it. Uh, this film, for instance, a uh, popular kids movie, had no female characters except for the very beginning. They kill her off immediately. You find out later, you find out later that a major character is female. Uh, does anybody remember who that was? The bird, yes. The bird is actually a female, but of course they can get away with that because they just assume and per pretend it's male um, throughout the entire story. So really, essentially, the message we're giving is, men, you're important. Your stories matter. Your lives are interesting. They're fascinating. We want to go to the movies and watch them. No, women, we don't want to pay attention to you. We don't care about you. And this is really a powerful message that we're sending. I mean, I get heartbroken every time my six-year-old little girl wants to watch a movie, and you watch a movie, does it have any girls in it? Oh, wow, you know, who in this movie is she going to be able to relate to? Who was she going to be able to look and admire? And we really sort of kind of sad, not finding a whole lot. When we talk about schemas, um, of course, we know sort of some of the characteristics of women versus some of the characteristics of men. Women are cooperative, nurturing, men are assertive, they're dominant. The problem is, is when we're looking at a lot of jobs, particularly high paying, powerful jobs, we want people who are going to fit. We want people who are going to match what it is we're looking for. Um, and the problem is, is the natural schema for women doesn't fit often the natural schema for powerful positions. So the school right now is looking for a president. And I can bet you right now it will probably be a man. Not because there's not a lot of qualified women out there, but people are going to think of what characteristics do we want in this, pre uh, in this present? We want him to be strong. We want him to tough. We want him to advocate. We want him to be powerful, stand up, you know, not be a pushover. All of these characteristics. Who fits that model? Who fits those characteristics? And it's characteristics of men. Women, when they do try to fit into these schemas of leadership, find themselves what is referred to in the literature as a tightrope. I was a gymnast. I used to be on a balance beam, you know, we used to do flips on this thing. I would rather be on that than often the tightrope that we have to uh, manage in the workplace. Because essentially, um, if we try to demand respect, show authority, show leadership, show assertiveness, um, uh, <coughs> There's one problem, but of course, if we sort of step over the other side to being more feminine uh, and show these characteristics, 
um, then we're viewed as less competent. So it's either, okay, be the bitch or be the dummy, essentially. And to try to walk this tightrope um, becomes really, really difficult. I think the, the <coughs> biggest examples, of course, were these uh, two women uh, in political position. Um, and one took the tightrope, became more feminine, and she was viewed as incompetent. The other one took the tightrope to be more assertive, and of course she has been lambasted uh, in the media. Uh, so, uh, when it comes to filling positions, what happens is they're looking for the right fit for a job. What that means is they're looking for someone who can fit this schema, who fits these characteristics. And the reality is, is particularly for leadership positions, men just look right. They just fit that position. They have the characteristics we were looking for. There's nothing overt about it. Uh, it, it just is viewed that way. One of the things that uh, I thought was a brilliant study that they did to sort of show how our perceptions shape um, and our schemas shape perceptions of people, they had quite literally people stand in a doorway. Men and women stand in a doorway where there was an objective measure because you could measure the height and they had uh, the subjects guess how tall they were. In every single scenario, they overestimated the height of the man and they underestimated the height of the woman. Because the schema is men are taller, women are shorter. And so they just assumed the men had greater height than they did and the women have lesser height. If we can get it wrong about something as physically measurable as somebody's height, how do you think we get it wrong when it comes to somebody's competency, somebody's intelligence, somebody's ability to, uh, to, to be leaders under these uh, situations? Um, and some of the other characteristics that play into schemas is women are far more likely to be evaluated on characteristics of their personal lives. Uh, so interestingly enough, the research has shown that women are not likely to gossip any more than men, but they are more likely to be the subjects of gossip. And of course this becomes part of their schema that women have to manage their personal lives um, uh, 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 properly. Um, and so the, the research has found, for instance, that uh, uh, recommendation letters are more likely to mention women's personal life characteristics. Oh, she's a great mother. She's a great wife. She has all of these personal characteristics. Um, whereas that's less likely to happen to men, but vice versa, women are more likely to be gossiped about in a negative way uh, at work, which undermines their credibility. One of the things that they're talking about now is what is referred to as benevolent sexism. Sexism that really just sounds so nice. Uh, Blick and Fist, uh, you know, found that nations that exhibit benevolent sexism actually have higher rates of inequality in them. And women themselves are more likely to endorse sexist policies. Uh, things like uh, women saying please and the, and, and the role of women. This was a true obituary uh, of a woman. Uh, this would be a good example of benevolent sexism. She made a mean beef stroganoff, followed her husband from job to job, and took eight years off to, uh, from work to raise three children. The world's best mom, her son Matthew said. Uh, but Yvonne Brill, who died Wednesday, 88 in Princeton, was also a brilliant rocket scientist by the way, uh, who in the 1970s invented a propulsion system to keep communication satellites from slipping out of their orbit. <laughs> I thought this was absolutely brilliant, uh, showing benevolent sexism. I mean, really what it comes down to is what is her personal life like? These were actual review comments. I'll read a couple of these. An online, uh, she hosts an online science show. Uh, Holy hell, you're a hottie. <laughs> Uh, I thought that because all the ways you were so proud to spout off that I'd something love science. In a, uh, I'm, I don't even know if I can Define. read that one. Uh, uh, I mean, you're a girl and you're beautiful. Wow, I just like science a little bit more today. Uh, yeah, uh, what? Girls don't like science, LOL. Totally thought you were a dude. 
Uh, <laughs> uh, it's not just being a girl that's a surprise, but being a fit girl. Um, and what this really showed, these are actually some of the real comments that she got. Um, no, of course, you know, they may appear as compliments, and some people may review them as compliments, but really what they're doing is telling them really what your role should be is sexual. Really what your role should be is family. Um, this is the schema that we want to make sure that you stay in. So getting to more of the subtle forms of sexism, I, I found this research actually extremely interesting. Based on some studies of the military, where they looked at how subordinates in the military and superordinates responded, um, so essentially military captains dealing with their subordinates, they found that there was a pattern of gaze. So they found, for instance, that when subordinates were listening, they looked in more intently. They made sure that they were paying attention. Whereas superordinates, they didn't really look as much when they were listening. But when talking, um, they made more eye contact. So essentially what they found was when you're talking and you make eye contact, you are showing authority. When you, um, uh, uh, when you look when listening, you're showing exactly the opposite. You're showing submission. You're showing deference. You're showing, I'm paying attention to you because you are the master. So they wanted to see if this same pattern existed with men and women. So they brought them in and they uh, examined their, their gaze. They had them speak on topics that they were well versed in. Um, and then they had them listen to somebody else. And what they found was this pattern emerged. Uh, men generally always use the gaze of authority. When they're talking, they make eye contact. When they're listening, they're not making much eye contact. Women are doing exactly the opposite. When they're speaking, they make less eye contact. And when they're listening, they make more eye contact. We don't pay attention to this, but what it is communicating is you're in charge and I'm not. And we're subconsciously doing this just in the way we look at each other in conversations. Uh, this was a, an interesting study where they looked at authority. Uh, and what they did is they put groups of students in conference rooms and they randomly put either a male at the head of the table or a female at the head of the table. And then they told these students, identify who is the leader in that group. And so the students had to look at the interaction between these people and decide who the leader of the group was. What was interesting was when the man was at the head of the table, they always identified him. They always identified the man when he was sitting at the head of the table. When it was a woman sitting at the head of the table, they did not necessarily identify her as the leader. They often chose some other man sitting in the room. <laughs> I thought it was the most interesting. Uh, this uh, second study I thought was actually very, very powerful. They wanted to see if how many female applicants there were in a pool of applicants, how it would affect people's perceptions of um, uh, of those applicants and what they found. So in some cases, female constituted less than 10% of the applicants, sometimes 30% of the applicants, sometimes uh, as many as 50% of the applicants. What they found was when women constituted a minority of the applications, meaning there were less than 25% of all of the applications for female, um, they found the ratings of those applications of women dropped. There was, they were rated more negatively. It wasn't until more than 37% uh, of them that women actually, the, the female candidates were actually rated uh, much higher. And what they figured out was happening was when there were fewer female candidates, it set off essentially a trigger. Oh, we got a female candidate. As soon as they recognized that it was a female candidate, the schemas kicked in. Ah, it's a female. And everything about being female was attributed to those applications, and they were rated more negatively. 
Now think about the implications for this for women trying to enter fields where there aren't very many women uh, into the sciences and to other disciplines and other job markets where they're going to be one of a handful of other women uh, applying. You know, the reality is, is that many women may not seek out these positions, not because they consciously know I'm going to get lower ratings because there's fewer other women in these applications, but they may know that they're not going to get as fair a shake in those areas as they would if they're competing with a larger pool of women. And here's the sad truth. It's true. It's true that women in areas and disciplines where there are fewer of them are ranked more negatively, comparatively, than women who are in professions and disciplines where there are more women. Uh, and the research has confirmed that this is true. So we don't like to look at women and we don't naturally think of them as leaders. And when there's very few of them, we rate them more negatively. Assertiveness. Some research has tried to show uh, what the consequences are um, when women um, uh, act assertively in situations. So this first study I thought was, was, was quite interesting. What they did was they brought students in and they had them uh, engage in a task where you're crash landed on an island. You have these nine items. I want you to rate them in order of how important they are going to be for your survival. So you have to rate these nine items uh, based on this, or, uh, this order. What the subjects did not know was that two of the people in the group were part of the study. There was one man and one woman. Now, in half the situations, they told the man to take the lead, try to direct the group to choose these items first. And they were scripted what to say, how to do this, um, what things you should say to direct the group and take a leadership position. And then, of course, half the time, the women were told to take the lead. So try to um, uh, take the lead, uh, encourage these items to be chosen, use these scripts, basically say uh, these things. And what they did, um, so they're scripted, they're trained to lead or cooperate, depending on um, how that particular session was, uh, was scheduled to go, to give suggestions, proposals, and reasons were all identical when it was the man who was chosen to be the leader or the woman chosen to be the leader. And then what they did, this was brilliant. They simply monitored the facial expressions of the subjects in the study. And what they found was that when the woman took the leadership role, people started making a lot of nasty faces. That's really what it came down to. Uh, that when she took uh, the leadership role, people clearly were exhibiting, um, essentially. Um, but they also found some other, so she was liked less. So when a woman took a leadership role in a conversation, to attempt, essentially trying to direct the, uh, the conversation, she was liked less, that was apparent. But what was also uh, interesting that this research um, identified and other research has identified as well is uh, uh, when the men were speaking, people listened to them more. So when it was the female speaking and giving her ideas and suggestions, people tuned out. When it was him speaking, people paid attention and they listened. So they had essentially an easier time holding the attention of the group and keeping the floor, as it was said. Uh, how many people in here have seen the research, for instance, that women, when they're speaking, are more likely to be interrupted uh, and uh, talked over, uh, these sorts of things. So this uh, showed. Then they did a post-survey of these subjects and sure enough, they rated the men as more skilled and more intelligent despite the fact that they gave the same arguments, the same reasonings, with the same language. They rated the men as more intelligent and more competent despite the fact that she was making uh, all uh, the same uh, uh, arguments and they viewed her, interestingly enough, as more emotional. <laughs> Uh, because that's the schema for women. Um, 
Yet, here's the interesting thing. Then <coughs> they measured all of these subjects on their sexist attitudes. And guess what showed up? Nothing. Nothing. They didn't exhibit any sexist attitudes, no explicit sexist bias. These people were as fair and egalitarian as the next person you'll meet. But yet in their meeting, they showed all the biases uh, that you would see. And so this actually reinforces uh, several other studies that have taken place regarding women in conversations, and particularly women in public conversations with people. Uh, this was uh, an interesting one. They put men in room, uh, men, and, uh, men and women in a room, and told them to discuss some issue. And at the end of the uh, discussion, they simply asked everybody, who talked more during this meeting? What did everybody say? Oh, women, they just never shut up. They're always talking. <laughs> no, blah, 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 blah. Women are always talking, right? This is, the, this is the stereotype. The perception was everybody in the room believed this. Both the men and the women believed that the women spoke more. So then what they did was they, of course, quantitatively calculated this. They calculated both the minutes spoken by women and the words spoken by men, uh, women compared to minutes and words spoken by men. And what do you think they found? Who talked more? Amen. The men, not only a little bit more, they talked substantially more but the women were viewed and perceived as dominating the conversation. And this relates to schemas. When the schema is for a woman to be quiet and submissive, and she is talking, it's automatically, oh my God, shut up. Uh, she's just talking so much. Uh, and this is essentially uh, what showed up. But they also found some other patterns as well. They found during the conversation, just like the other study that we just talked at, when women were in the middle of a sentence, they were more likely to be interrupted. Raise your hand, women, if you have ever had this problem trying to get a sentence in. Um, they're more likely to be dismissed. Oh, doesn't, that's not an important point, so their points are dismissed. How many women here have ever been in a situation where you've given a brilliant idea, you've ah, oh, it's not a good idea. Three minutes later, some guy makes the idea. Oh, yeah, it's a great idea. Why not think about that? Uh, I think most women have experienced this. If you haven't, you haven't lived long enough. Um, or you've just not paid attention to it. And women were more likely to be ignored. Um, so quite literally, nobody just even pays attention to what uh, they said. Uh, what they said. Uh, this was actually a study that came out this month. Uh, so very recently, Yale. Uh, and what they did is they wrote up a um, description of a fictional executive. Uh, the descriptions were exactly identical. Uh, there were two descriptions. One was a description of an executive, but he was, uh, but this person was, quote, talkative. And then they had a description of an executive who was quiet. And then what they did was half of them were assigned male and female, um, uh, half were assigned male, half female for both versions. So we've essentially got four descriptions here. Uh, talkative male, talkative female, quiet male, quiet female in these descriptions. And then they had people read these descriptions and give them a rating on their competency level. And what they found was for the men, they gave higher average ratings to the talkative male, 5.64 compared to a 5.11. So talkative men were rated more competent. What happened with the women, however, was exactly the opposite. The chatty woman, received a 4.83. Remember, the descriptions were identical. And the, uh, the quiet women were given a higher rating of 5.62. So this just sort of shows that we are just supposed to shut up. Uh, I like this. I was hoping to promote her, but I couldn't get a word in edgewise. Edgewise. Uh, Self-evaluation, the problem is if you're a woman and you're constantly in situations where people don't pay attention to your ideas, they ignore your ideas, they dismiss your ideas, they interrupt your ideas, what are you going to start to believe about your ideas? That 
smart, not, don't have that great of ideas. They're, they're smarter than me. They get more credibility than me. And they found this does impact women's perceptions of their own competency, of their own abilities. Um, and so they begin essentially to doubt themselves. Um, and they portray themselves uh, less confident. So it, it does create a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's like, ah, I'm not that smart at work, you know, I'm not coming up with the brilliant ideas, when really they're just being dismissed for the ideas. Uh, a recent study, what they had uh, uh, people do was they had them write two letters. Write a letter for yourself, describing your own abilities, then write a letter for a colleague. Uh, so um, essentially a, an evaluation letter. What they found was men wrote a much better one for themselves than they did for their colleagues. So when they wrote one about themselves, they were brilliant, they were awesome. Um, and when they wrote about their friends, oh, their friends okay. Women did exactly the opposite. When they wrote about a female friend, she's brilliant, she's awesome. When they wrote about themselves, they downgraded themselves in these letters. Uh, and this is something to be aware of. Uh, that women are under-evaluating and underrating themselves. Essentially, bragging doesn't fit the schema. We're not supposed to be bragging about ourselves. <sighs> this is really interesting. Failure. All of us are going to experience this in our careers. If you don't, you haven't really been trying in your career. We all fail. We all screw up. We all do things that don't work out the way we want them to be. But the research has shown that the costs of failure for women are much higher than the costs of men when they fail at work. Uh, what they found was that men, when they do something poorly or they don't do something well, people are more likely to make excuses for it. Like, oh, well, it was just bad luck, you know? No one was gonna do well at that. Or you probably just didn't try hard enough, you know? I bet if you put, you know, a little bit more effort into it, you'll be fine. When women failed at something, people were more likely to look at those women as less competent and less intelligent. It became characters, a uh, description of their character. This was more true when the task was deemed a masculine task, that women were uh, far um, uh, more likely, essentially, to get the dumb, incompetent perception at work when they fail. Uh, and what they also found was men, when they didn't succeed at something, were more likely at work to get coaching, how to make it better, more likely to get encouragement, you can do it better next time, and suggestions for how to improve than were women under the same exact circumstances. So at work, women aren't getting feedback of how you can make this better next time. They're just being told, ah, she's She's not that bright. She's not that dumb. They write her off. Without that feedback, she's unable to make the improvements necessary, of course, to work towards promotions uh, and these characteristics. And she's more likely to be viewed as just incompetent. Uh, negotiating salaries. How many people read the book Lean In? A few people. Um, I'm going to underpack quite a bit of what that says. I like the idea of lean in. My problem with the idea of lean in is it again draws the same assumption that all of these need to be pro uh, fixed by fixing women. If we just tried harder, if we just did something differently, all of these problems go away. It's our uh, uh, issue to fix it. But the research has actually shown that really the, the fixes need to be structural, uh, that women can't fix this stuff on their own. The most famous study, it's also referred to as the Bowles study. Uh, many, you, you'll see it in much of the, the gender literature. Uh, it had women negotiate for higher salaries. So they had to go in with the subjects, negotiate with, for higher salaries, and see how uh, they would uh, respond. And what they found was the subjects essentially were far more likely to not want to hire a woman who ne negotiated for, for higher pay. She's not someone I want to work with. 
and the penalty was five and a half times greater for women than it was for men. Um, so it, the interesting thing is, is that penalty existed even when the women were taught how to ask nicely um, uh, in this study. Uh, in another study, students were given folders uh, for well-qualified applicants and they were told the applicants were requested uh, higher salaries. And what they found was when the male and female candidate asked for much higher salaries, they awarded higher salaries to the men. And when the men and women uh, requested smaller salaries, meaning lower uh, salary increases, again, they assigned <coughs> more salary in uh, increases uh, to uh, the men. Uh, under those circumstances. Um, uh, another study uh, found that when women negotiate, men were able to negotiate on average about a 4.3% increase in their salary. Women were only able to negotiate about a 2.7 increase in their salaries with the negotiating process. Now, this is one negotiating process, one time. How often do you have to negotiate your salary during your career, if your career lasts 40 years? Every few years, right? Now imagine this difference compounding year after year after year after year. Every year, he's getting a 4% raise, you're getting a 2.5% raise. It may seem only a few percent uh, difference at the beginning of your career, What's it going to look like 20, 30 years down the road? This actually happened to Lily Ledbetter, one of the first legislation pieces that uh, uh, Obama uh, signed into um, law. Lily Ledbetter was working as a managerial position, and every year she got a smaller raise than her male counterparts, uh, discovered very late in her career <coughs> that she was getting paid drastically less than her male counterparts because it had accumulated over the years. Um, but this difference still exists. When men and women are constantly negotiating, women are getting smaller raises. Uh, Bowles decided to redo some of the study in part because of the book Lean In. And what they did was they taught women how to uh, essentially ask nicely what they, what they deemed relational language. I really enjoy the people I'm working with. Uh, would it be possible for me to negotiate this particular salary? So essentially, they trained these women how to follow all of the how-to rules of negotiating. And what they found was, yes, they were liked more. People who they were negotiating with were less likely to say, what a bitch. But the financial outcomes were any greater, meaning they weren't able to negotiate. This was last year. These women were not, through the nice process, able to negotiate for higher salaries. Um, so really what a lot of the research is saying is we need to stop putting this on the job of applicants negotiating. There need to be structural fixes where we can mediate the salaries and make sure that these salary differentials don't exist. We can't put it on the shoulders of women to try to increase their own salary position because the research shows it's just not going to happen. Negativity. Uh, this was a recent study, 2012, um, and it is based on actually an older study that was done with psychology professors. Uh, but this one, what they did was to 127 science faculty throughout the country, had them I, uh, review identical folders. Uh, some of them were randomized as male, some of them were randomized as female. The job position was lab technician, so they, had, uh, they were hiring lab technicians. <coughs> uh, and what they found was they rated the female folders as less competent and less hireable, even though the folders were exactly the same. And when they offered starting salaries, the average starting salary for the female folders, $26,500 a year. For the, the fake male folders, $30,000 a year. Uh, we're talking about almost a $4,000 a year difference here. These were identical folders. These were of science faculty. This was a study done last year, uh, or 2012, sorry, so two years ago. Uh, what was 
sadder about this was they looked at the gender makeup of the faculty to see if that made a difference, and what they found was female science faculty were just as likely to do this as male science faculty. So female science faculty hold all the same schemas. Women hold all the same schemas uh, as well. Um, and so the reality is, is what happens is women are evaluated more negatively at work. If we fail, we're more likely to be viewed as dumb. We're more likely to have our, uh, our ideas dismissed. We're uh, more likely to be disliked if we take leadership positions. Uh, all of these things happen. Um, so women find themselves in a position where they have to sort of figure out how to mediate their self-esteem, how to mediate their own feelings of competency, how to mediate essentially well-being in their own life. And so women are going to behave in ways that are going to try to maximize their feelings of success. Um, and so some of the things that they may do are uh, spend more time on some projects rather than getting a lot of projects done, only concentrate on the projects where you think uh, can get, garner attention um, or a positive feedback. So work on a pet paper that has to be published longer. Spend more time on it. Be less fearful about putting it out for evaluation. Uh, it can affect women in that way. And women are going to stick more easily in areas that they can be more successful. And unfortunately, there has been a lot of research and a lot of talk about women opting out of the workplace. Um, and a lot of people are arguing that we need to stop looking at this as women choosing to opt out. Maybe what we're really noticing is women are picking up on all of this negati negativity at work, the fact that they're being evaluated more poorly, they're getting lower, um, uh, less raises, and women are really being pushed out of the workplace. You're going to go and do what you can be successful. And if it's too hard to be successful at work, maybe there's another place that you can be more successful. Um, and so a lot of places have seen women. I mean, our little girls were taught, and women today were taught, the oyster's yours. We had the women's movement in the 1970s. It's all level playing field now. They get into the workplace. They can't pinpoint it. They can't identify it but they know it's not a level playing field anymore. What do you do? Uh, and many women, without really being able to identify all of these inequalities and all of these invisible sexist practices, are really just choosing to go to places where they can be successful. And, and home is one of those places. And to sort of finish, some of the things that, uh, in fact, one of uh, the, the women I read who wrote a book on this issue, whenever she does a talk, she always asks people in the audience, uh, does sexism occur in higher education? People raise their hand. Well, does sexism occur at your university? A few, fewer hands uh, get raised. Does it occur in your department? Well, then very few hands raised. Have you ever experienced it? And virtually no hands are raised. Um, so, one of the issues that, that we should be aware of is uh, that admitting that sexism happens, that these things happen, can make us feel a little helpless. Um, oh my gosh, well, if these things happen, what's the point? Um, and we can feel powerless. Um, and it's also actually referred to as just gender fatigue. Oh, I have to deal with this issue all the time. Um, but really one of the things that we, we should be aware of is that we do need to address these issues. We do need to make visible the invisible so we know it's happening. If we don't know what's happening, we can't do anything about it. But if we know what's happening, at least then we know a place to start and what things uh, that we can do. So, you know, the last option is admit these inequalities exist and, and start <coughs> working on policies and changes that might uh, uh, help these um, remediate themselves. Uh, so that is the end of my talk. Uh, are there any questions? Or did I just scare you all? <laughs> <laughs> I have a question. So I've read a lot of books lately on cognitive science. And a lot of them have been on using cognitive science to affect change, whether it be in your personal life or an organization like the Power of that 
So how would you suggest you would come to science and the discoveries made in that field to affect change in this manner? Um, I mean, I mean, I don't know how to use it because I'm not as familiar with the literature as that that you have. But I think some of it is that I mean, some of this stuff even uh, cognitive science sort of looks at essentially what's happening and how it's occurring. So maybe we could sort of you know work from from that level to sort of find those solutions. Um, I think like you know how the brain. I feel I've read how it, it does it takes so much energy to turn our brain. Yes. So there's all these shortcuts our brains are constantly making. And a lot of what you've been talking about is like is some of those shortcuts. And we do. And schemas are part of those. Uh, you know, one of the things I tell my students all the time in class is we do categorize people. Mm -hmm. We do. And you're not going to stop doing it because we need to organize information. And we're constantly organizing the information. Um, and we're, we organize it around roles of gender. Um, we put women in one group and we put men in another group and then we just organize a whole bunch of categories around this and this is just essentially what our brains do. Um, but if we're going to be uh, addressing, for instance, specifically gender inequalities, I think we should be aware of what characteristics we're, uh, we're assigning women that may or may not be fair and <laughs> legitimate and uh, may be harming them in positions of power, uh, these, these sorts of you know, I mean, really, knowledge about this, you know, is the greatest, I think, leverage we have. So, like, maybe seeing more movies, like, like, would you consider brain a step in the right direction? Yes, I do. And the mother-daughter relationship. Yeah, and, you know, the funny thing is, is why I'm not opposed to the princess movies, is because if we at least have princess movies, we can change the way they're portrayed. Mm -hmm. And there has been a movement. Um, I was really happy, and I love taking my kids to see Frozen. Um, because it wasn't a movie about men. In fact, the men were the side characters. It was a movie about two female characters. Um, and they had very different personalities and very different characteristics. Um, and they were people. Um, they weren't just a girl schema. They had diversity to them. They were complex creatures. Um, and. Uh, I, I, I really liked that. But when we don't put women in movies at all, or we just throw them in as a half-dressed you know, sex object, um, then we can't even address these schemas at all. We can't even address how we are creating these categories for little boys and little girls. You know, when, they're, when they're young, of course, that's when they're building these, these schemas, these ideas about who is, you know, who is what. Um, I actually had a question regarding that in your studies if you encountered anything, you know, lifespan wise, uh, when are these schemas developing and, and what can we do with children to sort of try to influence? You know, one of the one of the books I read actually there's been a ton of research and they have found that um, when you look at little kids before they the, essentially, the minute little girls and little boys begin to know I'm a girl and I'm a boy is when they start developing and identifying these characters. And the little kids will start punishing other little kids for deviating from their sexuals. And it happens about the time kids begin to realize I'm a girl, I'm a boy. They tend to peak around age five or six. Mm -hmm. You know, that's one of the worst, you know. A doctor, a doctor can't be a woman, for example. All right, so um, I know this is Women's Week, but don't you also think that there is a schema or sexism from men to men also? Yes. I mean, the men are supposed to be the strong and powerful. And yeah, so there's a documentary um, that uh, actually ties in with misrepresentation. What was the name of it? Man Up? No, it's the uh, Mask We Live In. The, the, what? Yeah. the mask we live in, um, which addresses that quite specifically. And yes, boys are told that they have to fit this schema and they're taunted and they're teased if they show any feminine characteristics at all. Um, and so boys are being pushed in a, into essentially a sex role um, just as much as girls are being pushed into a sex role. <coughs>
Any comment on pregnancy in the workplace? I mean, if there's ever a sexist identification immediately, it would be pregnancy. Yeah, that's a big story for me in and of itself. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so I had two kids uh, six and seven years ago, and I did not get maternity leave at all. The school had no way, essentially, to give faculty maternity leave. So I had two kids by cesarean section, walked into a class a week later with both of them in a sling. I then spent the next three years fighting the school to get um, maternity, leave, maternity leave for faculty. Um, the biggest argument against it was it's just really hard to find replacements. And trying to explain to people that it's really hard to find replacements doesn't mean you get to ignore the law. Um, <laughs> and uh, if the law's inconvenient. <laughs> and uh, so that was just one fight here. But particularly, there's been a lot of research in academia specifically. And <coughs> the problem is, is the average age where a woman graduates with her PhD is 32. And uh, the average age that, of course, women move into tenured positions are in their late 30s. Well, it doesn't take a rocket science to figure out that you start working at 32 and you won't be tenured until your late 30s. That are that is your childbearing years, and so. Uh, particularly in academia and for a lot of professional pos uh, positions like medical doctors and lawyers where the same trend happens is they, they, they contrast. So women's childbearing years happen to be the years that they have to be devoting all of their time to work and very little time to their family and you see a lot of women funneling out which is why what you see in academia is most women leave tenure track positions and they go to community college positions or adjunct positions uh, in far greater numbers um, and so there's there, there's, a, there's a huge trend there uh, I'll, I'll make a somewhat controversial claim and you can tell me why I'm wrong or maybe <laughs> you can agree with me it seems to me that the gender studies area is certainly kind of a cottage industry and we could have a presentation tomorrow night about how uh, there are all these ways in which boys and men are disadvantaged whether it's lower life expectancy or uh, poor performance in high school and college, whether it's the fact that after the Great Recession, men have really struggled more on average with retaining employment at all. So I guess my question to you is, how can we present, prevent well-meaning and well-intentioned research in this area from becoming kind of a zero-sum game where we end up kind of competing amongst ourselves rather than all excelling to you know, a more egalitarian society we'd all like to live in. Yeah, the truth is, um, whenever you increase essentially the competitive labor market, so it used to be men had access, white men had access to all the jobs. So we go back to the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, you were a white man, all the jobs were reserved for you. Um, you didn't have to compete with women and you didn't have to compete with minorities. Um, and that's not true today. So today, um, they do have to compete with women and they do have to compete with minorities and they can lose out in this competition, rightfully so. Um, and women and minorities can lose out in this competition, rightfully so. Um, so in some ways, you have to acknowledge that in many positions, men may not have the advantages that they've always had in the past. But maybe that's for the best because now we're getting equally um, uh, skilled women and minorities into those, those positions. Um, but the one thing I would, I would have to say, the minute uh, uh, men can come to me and say they're getting paid less than me and they're less likely to take le um, you know, executive positions and they're less likely um, to have their college degree pay them more money. I mean, here's, here's a fact for you guys. Oh, a man with a high school diploma has the same earning potential as a woman with a college degree. That's a fact. Um, and so as soon as it's reversed, then I'll start you know, pulling out my little tiny violin. But, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, we have to look at the realities of how they stand. Um, and, there ha and there has been a, a movement. I mean, men run Congress. They're our president. They, they are corporate executives. They pass our laws. Um, I, I don't think they're in a position of weakness to not 
pass policies that are going to going to help them. I think if you look outside the job market um, and, and just employment in general, there are negative effects on males. And I think the message is that any type, type of extreme gender stereotyping is bad for both genders. I mean, treating women as if they shouldn't be in these positions, men lose out because we don't have qualified women who could do a better job. At the same time, putting men in a position of not being able to express their emotions um, has an effect on them that they often take out on women. Yeah. So these gender stereotypes, both stereotypes hurt both senses. Schemas hurt both senses. Uh, actually, one of, has anyone read the book by Katie K. Womanomics? Yes, no. Um, one of the statistics that she brings up there is very interesting. Corporations that have a larger percentage of female executives <coughs> working in their board have higher profit ratings. Uh, and one of the arguments that is made is because if you are only picking the top talent from half the population um, and you're ignoring the other half of the top talent, you have less talent. Um, and so corporations that are looking across the top talent across both genders, uh, of course, are hiring better talent and doing better with profits. But schemas themselves are limiting. Um, you know, I, I look at my son, I look at my daughter, and they both cross in various areas. They both follow schemas in various areas, but they both cross. I mean, I tell people, I frequently have to rescue my older son from his little sister beating him up. Um, and it's been happening since she was four months old. Seriously, I've got pictures of it. Um, and, you know, they don't always follow those schemas. She, she runs faster than he does. You know, so I tell him, well, run like a girl, run you ask like your sister, you know. Um, and, you know, I try not to limit them that way, you know. Um, and, and, you know, we do need to break out of this limiting. Women can be leaders, and, and men can be compassionate, and um, we can... All of us hold as many a variety of personality characteristics as we want. Um. Uh, two things about schemas. Um, the other film, and I think you've probably been in so sociology classes, um, is uh, the Tough Guys uh, series. Very involved in, so I was thinking about. Yeah, that's, I think, I think the one I was talking about. Tough Guys. Yeah. And, and when we say that stereotypes that are uh, pigeonhole men are hard on men and stereotypes that pigeonhole women are hard on women, I think it's also important to say that the stereotypes that pigeonhole women are hard on men and vice versa. And Top Guys looks at the, um, really the epidemic of violence in our country and that that is a, that is a problem in that most of the um, shootings and, you know, the violent uh, youth to youth, all of that is, is the damage that men are doing to each other, but it also means that women are living in a culture of violence, right? So you can see how it's totally en enmeshed. And there was a question earlier, how do we address schemas? And I think that um, in a university, one of the most important things that we have to do is a collaborative approach to it. So that when we look at, for example, <coughs> when we're hiring, if we get some training about our schemas and then spend time, um, or we, we're sitting on the uh, ASNF or something, we spend time committing to, um, we're gonna help each other be aware when we're operating out of our schemas. Uh, we, uh, from them is what I mean. So that that it, we can create a safe place where I believe that, even if it's maybe just when there are three of us or five of us, but a safe, committed place where you say, you know, I really think you've fallen into this uh, way of thinking when you're reading this um, application or something like that. So uh, the old phrase uh, from, from um, you know, when I was, um, the early feminist is, is consciousness raising, but it's the same idea that it is cognitive, it's the self-talk, the self-talk, but it's also talking to each other. Uh, so a series like this is really important. It in itself helps. Uh, I don't know whose hand came across you and then I'll get you. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, just want to quickly address this idea of what I've always referred to as patriarchy hurts everybody, yeah. um, which is I think kind of what people are picking up here and there. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that we can say that patriarchy hurts everybody and there's a strong imbalance that negatively affects women specifically. We can hold both of those things because they're both true. Yeah, yeah. So absolutely. Yeah. That. absolutely. Yeah. So I think the major question is, is it possible for both male and female to be out of this oppression working one and one? <laughs> Sorry, this is our class. <laughs> in my utopian world in the future. Um, exactly. Awesome. <laughs> um, and I think we're moving in the right direction. If you look at all of the research, even at, like, for instance, I tried to get as recent uh, housework information as I could, because the trend is, is improving. And, you know, if it keeps improving in 50, maybe 100 years, <laughs> um, you know, we might, be, we might be coming close. Um, it, it depends on where they're happy with the rate of improvement. You know, I, I do see it as improving. You know, I ask my question this all the time, though. I look at my little girl and my little boy, you know, about the same age, and I wonder, you know, if I have to predict their jobs when they're a grown-up. Um, my daughter is brilliant. She's really, really smart. She's as smart as my son. But I sit there and I look at him, and I come to this realization that the reality is he's probably going to earn more money than her. Will that change in 20 years by the time they're grown up and they're working in the workplace? Will she have um, ability to convince people she's as competent as he will be able to convince people he's competent? Because that's really what it comes down to. We're all trying to get people to see us for as intelligent as we are, right, and what our capabilities are and what our competencies are. And women, we just have a harder time convincing people. Um, and she's going to have a harder time getting people to see her as intelligent as he will, uh, particularly in the workplace. Um, I'm a sociologist, not a psychologist. And part of the reason I'm a sociologist and not a psychologist it's not because I don't like psychology. I think most of this research has been psychology is brilliant. But I'm a firm believer that I, I think we need to make structural changes. Because once you've changed structural changes, people will follow as a result of this. We need to stop the negotiation practices for salary increases. We need to set fixed salaries um, in fixed positions. Uh, and that's what they are. Um, and raises need to not be negotiated. They need to be fixed. If they're applied to one person, they're applied to all. We need to make structural changes uh, un under these. We need to take affirmative action to address these changes. And, and I think once you change the structure, the schemas, the attitudes, the psyches will follow. So kind of leading off that, I was wondering, in the 1970s, for example, the blatant uh, sexism that you would see, it's very easy to have legal precedents that combat that. Are there any legal precedents, uh, precedents that come to mind that combat invisible sexism? Um, no, the stuff is, the, the, the problem is it's under the radar. I mean, yes, you could have been evaluated more negatively because you're a female, but how do you prove it? In these studies, they gave identical folders. They can prove it. But whenever um, a, a female, for instance, going to her boss and say, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this, I believe I deserve this raise, um, they can essentially, I mean, no one is ever exactly perfectly comparable to somebody else. And that's the problem. There's always some reason that you can come up with, and people don't even know they're doing it because of gender. So you can't say you're doing this because of gender because they don't even realize they're doing it because of gender, um, even though we, the research indicates that that's probably what's happening. So the legal, the legal rights for a lot of this stuff that I talked about are virtually non-existent. We have time for one more question. Sorry. I don't know who raised their hand first. <laughs> who raised their hand first? <laughs> That's why I feel like it's um, just really hard to change um, over time, you know, and I don't, um, I'm, yeah, pretty pessimistic about it changing because, because of, you know, that there is your piece, like you said, and it's structurally, yeah. but the, something that's, you know, because we all have schemas. The, the sad thing is, is 
females in these subjects were doing it just as much as the males were. Um, that's the important thing to remember. This is not something men were doing to women. This is something we're all doing to women. Um, but my hope and my optimism comes from the last 20 years we've done and conducted, and they have been done and conducted some pretty damn good studies. And if these studies can get out there to people, um, uh, to human resources people working around the country, I, I, think, I, I, think that's, I think that's the best start that we can make. All right, let's thank um, Dr. Hill one more time.